morning, everyone. All right, uh, let's pray and uh, see what God has to say to us this morning. Father, we are here this morning, and we just want to sit in your presence, that we might be able to listen and be transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we could go out into the world and be walking closer with you, and to be people who are authentically living out faith. We pray this morning as we uh, look into the book of James and continue this series, uh, the kick in the guts that it is, I pray that, uh, that the conviction is at the right level for us, where we may move uh, to you, that we may turn to you uh, in repentance, um, if that is uh, what you ask us to do today, and uh, that we would turn to you in thanksgiving and praise for all the things that you are doing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, uh, we're continuing in James, the kick in the guts book. And it is a kick in the guts. This is probably the toughest sermon I've prepared. Um, But that's, I think, just because I'll get a bit vulnerable for a a little bit. So I'm just going to read the passage. And I just want uh, us to just uh, be willing to hear the early stuff to get to the later stuff. That's what I'll say. Uh, So chapter 2, verse 14 to 26 is what we're going to sit in. Um, Some of the passage this morning, uh, the passage is in NIV, and then some of the other stuff I'll do is NLT, if you're trying to uh, find why some of the words are a little bit different every now and then. So verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. If you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did, when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. This is the word of the Lord. What are some of the problems of our time? So this is not going to be a rhetorical question. You can just shout them out to me. What are some of the problems of our time? Greed? Wars? Okay, cool. All right, so people have faith. Say they have faith, but they don't show it by what they do. Okay? Individuality. Yep. Gospel. Yes, me culture. Awesome. Gospel. Self-centeredness. Yeah, cool. All right. We could go on, I'm sure, for ages. Um, what I want you to think about is perhaps in your personal life, the people that you're around, who is it, uh, not who is it, uh, what is it that you would say maybe your top five problems that you see uh, that maybe God brings before you 
Um, perhaps one of them is in your own life. Perhaps some of them are in other people's lives, and your heart is going, God, you're showing me this stuff. I know that these are problems in people's lives right now, and, and we want to see change. Um, I think my top five uh, would be sex, entertainment, um, alcohol, fatherlessness, um, and, and maybe just broken homes. So if that was my top five, that's the people I'm around. So, so when I'm um, hanging out with people at work or I'm at TAFE uh, or, or when I was in school um, just a couple of months ago, these are the kinds of people that I think God would just show, look, this is stuff that's going on in people's lives every single day. And um, I, I feel a little bit overwhelmed at the moment. Um, I'm not sure uh, why right now compared to a little while ago, but there's just this, there's this presence that sits with me that there is a, it's going further into the church. It's, it's something that is infiltrating the church where we're allowing culture to, to hit the church and we're not really saying much about it. So <clears throat> this might be a message uh, for you personally, but the other way that I look at it is um, our young people, especially in the evening service, probably are involved in things that are godless. As we all are in different ways, there are things that affect our lives that are godless. But I think for our young people, they're the ones that are completely saturated in this stuff without perhaps the handles to know what to do with it. And maybe uh, as people who have lived and experienced more, even, even uh, you guys may not have that experience either because the internet is just ruthless and all sorts of things. And so you still go, I don't know what to do. But what I think we can offer is to be led by the Spirit and that God will have something for us to do and to say into people's lives that uh, may not be the tech savvy, we know what's going on on the internet and all this stuff, but we can affect the next generation's lives to see them turn back to God. So um, in verse 14 to 19, I'll reread it. And uh, in this section, James looks at it and he says, um, do you have faith or do you have works? Actually, you can't have one without the other. So let's have a look. Uh, what good is it, my dear brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. If you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So I'm very thankful we did faith space this morning, because I just wanted to be reminded at how much... God is moving, and also how much you are letting God move. Because um, sometimes when you prep sermons, you just think, man, where are we going? Like, you know, what's God doing with us? Um, and so these next uh, three things is, I just want us to kind of consider if we're living our faith and we don't have deeds, or we are living a works life, but we actually don't really have faith, there's usually something else that comes in instead. It's not like you can kind of sit in, at home in your quiet little faith and nothing else happens. If you don't have the Spirit of God um, leading you and sanctifying you, then what else is happening? The world's probably getting in, in some way. And so there are three things that I think uh, will often crop up. Uh, one is um, people become a little bit liberal where uh, people do good works and live a good Christian life, but their faith is not really trusting Jesus. They've had a saving faith at one point, perhaps, but uh, maybe culture has crept in, 
and we've allowed ourselves to become lukewarm, as Revelation would say, where we're, you know, happy to hear on Sunday a bit about Jesus, and then we, we get our hour and a half in, and we go back out into the world, and then we're kind of just accepting of all the issues that are against God. And we don't really speak up about things. And we kind of become a little bit liberal because we're just, we're just going to be good people, stay in our lane, and not really make waves. Um, so perhaps that stirs us up a little bit, and we, and we get into that thing because we just don't have the courage to, to continue to have faith. Um, the other one is uh, perhaps we can become Pharisees, where we come into church and we're all religious, and we, we get involved with heaps of stuff, and, and we're all about works, and we're really trying to live by the letter of the law, and we get frustrated. Man, other people aren't living by the letter of the law. What's going on here? Maybe we get a little bit critical, and uh, maybe we cast some judgment on people. It might not be outspoken. It might just be in our hearts, and we're, just, we're getting bitter, and we're getting frustrated. And, and so a Pharisee can creep in, where... It becomes based about, around works. I mean, you can just read the Gospels and watch Jesus go to town with the Pharisees. If you would like some homework this week, go for it. But our hearts are just inclined to become good people, not God people. And, and I know that at some point, if, if you have a saving relationship with God, we got to a point where we were on our knees in humility and we had surrendered to God and we would repented and we said, okay, God, we need you, and we've got to stop being the Pharisee. I don't have to just be a good person. I've got to be a saved person. And so maybe that's, maybe that's the, uh, the, the thing that happens if we're living with faith uh, but without works or works without faith. And the third one is that the world just creeps in. And I think this is the one that affects young people the most. Maybe it's because that was my experience, but I still think it's, it's very prevalent, is that especially if you grow up in church, but you're in church, you know all the stuff, you, you accept Christ into your life, but there's so much of the world that you haven't let go of. You said, yes, I want Jesus. I know I want heart change. I know I want him in my life. He died for my sins. I want that out of my life. And that was my issue. When I became a Christian, I was just a bit before 15 and then turned 15, and it wouldn't have been long after being 15 that... Uh, I joined the pornography merry-go-round. And as a teenager in high school, boys just talk about sex all the time. And none of it is good. It's always filth. It's always um, objective. It's not, it's not about how God has created women beautiful and all this stuff. It's, it's, just, it's just objects. And, uh, and obviously today we've got the internet with phones and everything. And... Uh, do your kids look at porn as a teenager? Probably. Um, when I was 19 and started dating Tish, I was still struggling with pornography. But I couldn't handle it anymore because I was living this life of faith, but I wasn't really living faith with deeds because I was, I was turning up to church. I was kind of starting to lead youth group. I was serving. I was participating but I wasn't in a space where I could authentically witness to other people, especially teens, who were learning how to have relationships. That's a kicker, because what teen isn't learning how to have relationships or a young adult? And so when I was learning to have a relationship, I had to fess up quick. And so I, I was struggling in it, and I fessed up to Tish, and I just kept making the covenant that Job make. I have made a covenant with my eyes. And I just ruthlessly pursued Jesus. And I mean ruthlessly. Because pornography is, is an addiction that transforms your brain pathways. And you've got to undo that. So the only way to undo that is to let Jesus change your brain. And so for us as men and women who have struggled with it or are struggling with it now, you've got to ruthlessly let Jesus into your life to change that part of your life. As he says, you've got to cut off sin. He's not joking. <laughs> you've got to cut it off. 
And so I was ruthlessly pursuing Jesus out of the desire to be pure with Tish. And don't get me wrong, we had our struggles, but if I went into marriage with this porn addiction, man, it would have destroyed it. And, and we see it. We see it all the time. We, see, we know people in our lives where people have become divorced and things have crept in and uh, it has broken people's lives up because of that kind of thing. Now, that's my story. I don't mind what it is. There is things in the world that get into us that means that we're in a space where we say we have faith, but we aren't able to, to have deeds because we know that sin has got a hold of us. And so we're in this setting. This is modern-day culture. I grew up watching TV shows like Friends. It's about hookups. It's, you know, it's, it's just standard culture. You watch TikTok. You watch whatever it is. It's, it's going to be in our faces. And so it's a huge question for us today to answer if we're liberal, if we're pharisaical, or if we've been consumed by the world. How do we get back to Jesus and make sure that our faith and our deeds are together. Because we are saved by faith, trusting in Jesus. That's the good thing because we, don't, we can't do anything to make ourselves right with Jesus. We, we have to be taken by the blood of Jesus, saved, so that we may live eternal life with him through faith. And then our works will be exemplified. We'll be obedient to Jesus. We will want to know Jesus so much that our obedience to him is forthcoming. And so what will actually happen is something will click in our lives that obedience in Jesus is freedom and it's beautiful and the world can start to see it. So in the second section of James, he addresses this issue. And so he shows us what does it look like to have faith and action together if If the problem is faith without works or works without faith, how do we put it together? How do we know that Jesus is going to be the Lord of our life and we can live this way? He says in verse 20 onwards, You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? you see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So you can look up the story of Abraham and you can look up the story of Rahab. Um, if you don't know them very well, and you can do that this week. It's two incredible stories of faith in action. The first one with Abraham, he's lived a life, and this is an encouragement here. Abraham lived a life where God had promised him he was going to have an heir, but there was a moment where he didn't trust that moment, and he had um, a kid with his uh, slave Hagar. He made a mistake. And... Then you get to the end of the story, and it says here that he was God's friend. He was God's friend because in his journey of faith, he continued to seek God and trust him and then act on it. And so you see in Abraham's story, he gets put with the incredibly difficult choice, and this is, this is where faith comes in. It's a choice that actually is a hard decision. We have to step out. Abraham has to step out in faith to go and offer his son, the heir, Isaac, as a sacrifice. And so he's on that journey. He's heading up the mountain. And when he gets to do it, God replaces Isaac with a lamb. By faith, Abraham stepped out 
and he lived out what God was asking him to do. By faith, he had to trust God and take a step. He couldn't just sit back and get liberal about it and go, oh, I'll, just, I'll just do the lamb and I'll just call it Isaac and that'll be right. No, he had to step out and he had to live the, the choice that God was asking him to, to make. Um, with Rahab, the prostitute, she's living in Jericho and, and uh, the Israelites are going to come in and take the land. So Joshua sent two spies into Jericho to, to come and check it out and, and they stay at her place and she has experienced God. She has heard that God has brought them through the Red Sea and that they have been conquering people, and that they are doing things um, because of the power of God, that God is undefeatable. And so Rahab has made a choice. She has put her faith in God. She has realized that God is the one and only God. Chapter 2, the one and only God. I know that your God is the one and only God, and he is the one that is bringing you Jericho. And everyone is afraid of you guys. And so what does she do? She hides the spies. And it was the king that asked her, where are they? You know, you could have flaked on that. You could have been really, really afraid of the king and, and, done all, uh, and, and handed them in. But by faith, she knew that God was going to uh, give his people Jericho. And so she said, you spare my life and my family's life, and I will hide you, and you, can, you guys can go, and you can come in and take the place. And that's exactly what happened. Her faith was met with action where she stepped out, she took the risk, trusted in the Lord God who can do the impossible. See, faith makes us move with God. That's what faith is. That first time that we humbled ourselves before God by faith, we said, we know God, you're the king, and we need you we're sorry for our sins. Please be the Lord of our life. If that's our first step, then the rest of our life is walking with God by faith, daily going, we need you, God. We're going to step out today and be led by you. And so the last point is the, the last sentence in the passage As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. As believers, we have Holy Spirit to lead our whole life. And that's the most beautiful thing. Because where the spirit is, there is freedom. And so I want us to leave with courage this morning. Perhaps you start with repentance because you know, I've, I've been here and I want to be here. But we can go out this morning and we can trust in the God who saves and he's got something for us to do, to step out in faith and use our deeds to show the way to to God. In Matthew 7, 21 to 27, it says this. It says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is is wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock, Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the wind beats against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Faith and works is obedience. It's trusting God that his word is true and we obey it. And the way we want to do it is asking the Holy Spirit to daily lead us. You see, true believing is not an act of understanding only. It's not like you read the passage in the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies. Cool, I understand that. 
It's actually a work of the whole heart where God has to change us to actually love our enemies. So we have to ask God to sanctify us, to make us holy. A Holy Spirit-led people. And so I just want to finish kind of with where I'm up to in my faith journey in, I think, how the Spirit leads me. Um, and it's a really good book. If you're, if you're really interested in learning this stuff and you'd love God to enter into a, a way where you go, how do I put my faith and actions together? Mike Frost has an evangelist book called Save the World. And in that book, uh, he just comes up with five ideas with how you put your faith and actions together because his concept is not everyone's an evangelist, but everyone should be evangelistic. And so you've got to live questionable lives really beautiful lives. Now, I won't go into that book too much, but here's a story that he does. Um, In about 300 AD, there was a Caesar called Julian, and he had a problem with the Christians because the the Christians were converting so many people to Jesus that it was causing his leadership grief, and people weren't worshipping Caesar and worshipping pagan gods and all sorts of things. And what had happened, he realized, was that the Christians were loving people. Can you believe it? They were loving people. And so you had some evangelists out there sharing the word of God, and then you had all these Christian people showing their deeds. They were living by faith, and they were showing their deeds. They were being hospitable. They were looking after the poor. They were looking after people in need. And as they were doing this, it was helping people turn to Jesus. And so Julian and Caesar decided, I know what we're going to do. We're going to outlove the Christians. And so he set up a food program and he um, set up hostels for poor people to live in. Only thing is the pagan priests didn't want to do it. They didn't want to love people because they didn't have Jesus Christ, who is love, transforming their lives. And so the Christians just keep doing their thing. And as we know, eventually Rome became a place where Christianity was accepted because of all the persecution Christians went through, loving people through their deeds and through their words, but not because they were just going out there doing works, but because they trusted in Jesus. They had joy, they had peace, they had the fruits of the Spirit with them, and they would go into those places being led by the Spirit. And so one of the concepts that is the most important concept, I think, in Mike Frost's book is this. Listen to the Spirit. You remember, uh, I don't know if it was a month or if it was last year, but uh, but, uh, Phil led us through the series, and um, he used this phrase, which I use every single day, Jesus, I am here. And he just wanted us to be introduced to the presence of God that we would let the Spirit speak to us, that we might be transformed to go and live out our faith and deeds. And so my encouragement to you today is to listen to the Spirit and do what the Spirit is saying to do. Jesus, I am here. Jesus, I am here. Just speak. Just speak. I'm listening. Jesus, I am here. And so I do this every day on the way to work, driving the car. Jesus, I am here. And so the way that God has used my pornography problem as a teenager is that as he purified me, I know all these people that have... uh, these, this pornography addiction, and I am able to speak into that. And uh, I ask the Spirit daily, okay, God, what do you want me to say or do for people today? Who am I to speak to? Give me a name, give me an image. And there are people um, at the moment um, in TAFE, there are people with anxiety and depression, all the boys are talking about sex every single moment. And I just sit there, and I'm, I'm okay to be in it all now because I am able to have faith and deeds and be a light in that place, because I'm not going to get involved in that stuff. I'm going to speak into that stuff. 
or I'm going to offer something into that stuff. And so faith space this morning was beautiful. Kate, that was awesome. I just love that story that you stopped, that you, you heard the Spirit. You heard the Spirit say, stop. So what will the Spirit say to you this week so that your faith and your good deeds will go together? So we're going to pray, and we're going to sing one more song. And This song is just a, a worship song that says, Only a Holy God. And there's a few options. Only a Holy God is just singing about how incredibly good God is. And so when we sing it this morning, perhaps you want to sit there and you just want to uh, reflect and, and know that God wants to change your heart and you are sitting there and you're going, okay, I need to repent here. And, and you can sit there and take that song in and do that or stand. Um, or you might have a story like Kate's or where you can just praise God in thanksgiving and go, God, the faith and the deeds, they came together and you magnificently glorified your name. And so let's glorify God's name now. So let's pray and let's sing. Father, we thank you that in a world that is, uh, can feel overcoming, can feel like a place that is difficult to live in and a place that uh, maybe makes us silent at times because we just know that that is not the way you want us to live. I pray, Father, that you would help us to have our faith and deeds line up with each other, where we might be able to be led by the Spirit to do the things that are bold. Because it is so scary sometimes, God, to step out in faith and do something that might make people angry or it might come back at us. But I pray, Father, that we would have faith to step out and do such things. In your Son's name.